Welcome to the Electronics Basics series. Make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon to get notifications. I'm going to do a video every day. So make sure you come back again tomorrow. So in this video, I'm going to talk about multimeters and using them. Now, I've got a selection of my multimeters here. This isn't even all of them. <laughs> mm. So I've got a range of some of these budget meters, like this low cost for DIY kind of Kiwi's. I've also got this old one here, which I've had for, I don't know, 25 years. I've got some clamp meters, a couple of these, Uni T1, and a, I don't know what brand that is, Digitech, which is like a local electronic store brand. Another Digitech meter here, this is low cost meters. Got a couple of Bryman meters here, which are EV blog branded. Um, I've got four flukes, I've got another Bryman here. So this meter here, this meter here, fairly expensive, as is this one here, especially. Um, the flukes are expensive meters. The high quality though, so you pay more for a fluke as you would otherwise do for the same features on a different meter. That's meant for professionals and for industrial use. You know, these things are designed to be able to blow up in your hand without injuring you kind of thing, you know? <laughs> this wouldn't do that. Anyway, what I want to try and show you is that I've got all these meters and you don't actually need to have one of these high-end flukes or, you know, these really high-end ones. I mean, you don't need that. These Brymans work well. I've been really happy with these, especially this one, this one's really good. But for basic stuff, you don't need a high-end meter. If you're just doing a bit of tinkering around, a bit of DIY, you're trying to learn electronics, just trying to figure out what you're doing, one of these cheaper meters will probably do fine. I'm not so sure about auto-ranging Kiwi's ones, and I've got this must tool one here, which wasn't too bad. So I've done reviews on these multimeters, right? So I have reviewed this one, this one, this one, this one, that one, this one. They've all got reviews done. The other meters don't have reviews. I probably should do reviews on them actually. Yeah, so if you want to see more about those meters, then check out my multimeter review video playlist. This one's got my desk gear, the ones you can see. So, yeah. So the question is, what do you actually need to know to use a multimeter? Well, you need to know what you want to measure. If you're going to measure volts, AC or DC, current, AC or DC, Resistance is really common, it's almost like a no-brainer, everyone wants resistance. Sometimes you want capacitance readings, but I'd actually recommend you get a capacitance meter for that. Pop it LCR meter is what I'd recommend instead of using a multimeter one. That is generally better for that. I mean, yes, multimeters, a lot of these multimeters have got capacitance built into them, and they're fairly accurate, to be honest. They do have limitations, it's not as good as a pop it LCR meter. If you're going to do non-invasive current measurements, you'll probably want a clamp meter. There's different types, this one does AC and DC. But what DC one means you can actually measure DC circuitry. Um, AC ones can only measure AC circuits. You can't measure much else. This one actually does do AC and DC as well. But this is a higher current. This is like minimum scale of 600 amps DC. Whereas this one is 2 amps DC. So if you're a hobbyist working on electronics, this one here is much better suited to you. I've actually done a mailbag video about this. And I think I've done a review on this actually. Pretty sure I've done a review on this particular meter. So the UT210E. It's a good little meter. I really like this one. It's good. Pretty handy to have. It also has probe connection, so you can actually do measurements with the voltage and stuff as well. Another really useful feature is a continuity measurement test. So you, you touch between two points on a circuit board and it'll beep at you or tell you resistance. Diode test is also extremely critical to have if you're doing testing of transistors and diodes. You need to have diode test mode. But those sorts of things are very common across meters. I think just about every meter here has got diode test mode. Even this cheap one here has got it. So I think all of them do it actually anyway. You've got some more advanced functions which you probably don't need to worry about, um, such as DBM and, and you know, this is a high-end meter, this one's quite an expensive one. Temperature measurements is also fairly common, a lot of these meters have got temperature measurement on. Not all of them, but some of them do as an option. That may or may not matter to you. Sometimes having a way of measuring temperature with a probe is handy. So this old Digitech meter here, I've had this one for 20 years. It's had a bit of a beaten up life. It's been dropped and thrown around and left outside. and It's had a hard life, been using a workshop and, and it still goes. Accuracy, I don't know, it's probably not great now, but this was a fairly well featured meter when I got it. It did microamps for that as well, so it's actually not a bad one. But I mean, it depends on what you want to actually measure. I mean, if you want really good accuracy, you probably want to spend a little bit more, you know, go a four and a half digit meter. Three and a half digit will do most of what you need, though, to be honest. Three and a half digits is usually plenty. You don't usually need that much precision. Of course, you always go to a bench meter. I mean, I'm only showing you the handheld meters here. I've also got some pen style meters. And I've got a few bench molder meters as well, which are basically sit on a shelf and they're plugged into the mains. But I actually find myself using these kinds of meters more than I use a bench meter. Bench meter is super accurate. It's got much, you know, it's like six and a half digits, the one I've got here. So much higher accuracy and stuff like that. But if you need that position, you use a bench meter. But if you don't need it, then these kinds of meters are absolutely fine. And I find them much more convenient, to be honest. All right, so enough to talk about multiple meters. Let's actually show you how to use one. So basic DC measurement. So there's a DC symbol, it's like a flat line with a dotted line underneath it. That's the AC symbol, which is a sine wave, right? 
So that's the DC symbol, and we set the volts. Probes are in the volts, ohms, diode, and common terminals in this case. All right. This is what this meter has. It, it will depend. I mean, there's always a common, which is a negative, and then you got another connection which you use for different modes. So this one's doing volts, ohms, and milliamps, for example, on this chip meter here. This one here's only got two terminals, so you can't really get that wrong. Um, but it depends on what your meter actually spares. So read the terminals on the front and see what they say. Especially important if you're trying to measure current, because if you use the current, you may get that wrong, blow your meter or blow your fuse or something, or cause all kinds of problems. So power supply over here is, is turned on, it's set at 5 volts. I've got 100 milliamp current limit set to it as well. But measuring voltage, current limit is irrelevant in this case. And we're getting 5.02 volts out of that power supply, which is actually pretty accurate. That's good. If you wanted to do millivolts, in this case it would be over range, alright? So I wouldn't recommend you do this. Listen to a 600 millivolt range. If I drop this down, there you go, it's half a volt, so that should be about 500 millivolts. Here we go, 500.1 millivolts. If you're only doing less than a volt, it'll still work on here too. It doesn't matter. But you get more accuracy from using the millivolt range if you're within the range of the millivolt range. So that's that. AC is for measuring AC voltages. It could be low voltage, it could be you know, a couple of volts or so, even. but generally it's used for higher voltage AC stuff, like you know mains power kind of thing. Typically it's what it's used for. Over here we've got ohms and capacitance. So we've got ohms here. If I short these together, that's going to give us a zero ohm resistance basically. In this case it's got 0.1 because it's a little bit of lead resistance, which is normal. You do get some lead resistance. Some meters are better than others for that. Some leads are better than others for that. See differences. So if I measure A resistor, let's get this board over here. If we measure A resistor, it doesn't matter what it is. And there's the resistance. Now some meters have manual ranges. This one's got auto ranges. Like this cheaper meter here. This has got manual ranges for resistance and for voltage. So that's an auto ranging meter. So you don't have to worry about it. This one, you have to do it manually. So if you know what voltage you're going to be measuring, you can do the range manually and select that range for like voltage and resistance over here, for example, right? And current and AC volts as well. So this is AC is only offering two voltages in here, 200 volts and 500 volts, to give you an idea. Now this also has capacitance on it. This meter does not. Uh, capacitance in this case, you just push the button here to change modes. And it will change the capacitance mode. So if I then wanted to try and measure a capacitor, let's find something suitable. Let's try this one. There you go, so I can measure that capacitor in circuit there. That's capacitance. But again, for capacitance, I recommend you get an LCI meter. This mode here is, like it says resistance again, See there's a little sound indicator. Most meters will have a continuity mode, not all meters do. So in this case, when it detects a short, it will beep. Like there's a jumper link here. Right, that's that one. We've also got diode mode. In this case, we have pushed the button to get the diode mode. There's a diode indicator there. This meter also has diode mode over here. It's a really common mode. So then you can test junction of transistors and diodes. So here's a diode here. Put it. Reverse bias, we should see something, hopefully. There we go, 0.5 volt. volt. That's the voltage drop across the diode, right? So that's how much voltage it's losing as it passes voltage through the diode, which gives an indication of whether the diode is working correctly or not. If you do the other round, it should be basically open. I've got some charging there because it's connected to circuit where there's capacitors which are charging up. If you had a short when you measure the diode, the diode is blown, or there's some circuitry around that diode which is causing it to give a false reading. Usually it's a diode is blown. Over here we've got milliamps range, which is DC and AC milliamps. We've also got Hertz range, we've also got Hertz over here and Hertz over here. Um, again, that's only for really doing AC or sources which have a frequency associated with them so you can measure the frequency. And also got down here as well in the amps range too. But this is AC and DC milliamps, AC and DC amps. In this case, you use different ports. So if I wanted to measure the current in this power supply, which I know I've got limited, don't do this at home, folks. <laughs> well, we can actually, but it's perfectly safe as long as you've got it set up right. So I'm going to do this milliamps. This has a built-in 400 milliamp fuse. This should not blow the fuse, even though I'm going to be shorting out the power supply. So I've got the common connection and the current connection, right? This basically means it's a short between a meter. You wouldn't normally go between positive and negative doing this because it is going kind to of short out the power supply. But I'm doing this to demonstrate what's going on. So this is currently set to AC and I change it to DC. And get this probe on properly. There we go. So the, the power supply is set at 100 milliamps limit. We're getting 103.9 milliamps as the limit coming through. And you can see 101 on the power supply over here. So that's measuring the current. What I'm doing here is not what you normally do. You wouldn't normally catch these leads across the power supply. This is normally if you're trying to feed a circuit and trying to measure how much power that circuit is using. So what I'm doing is a bit of a bodge just to demonstrate it. Anyway, we'll go to the amps region instead. We'll do amps. 
unplug that from there, plug that in there, plug go to amps. So this meter D falls to AC, so you gotta watch out for that. Make sure you're on DC again, 104. So now because I'm on this 10 amp range, I can put the current up a bit. Let's do half an amp. And if you're powering a circuit, you'd use this to measure the power the circuit is consuming. You wouldn't normally use it this way. Now, this is also a great time to demonstrate the clamp meter. Now, this has got the same functions. It's got volts, AC and DC volts, which is in here. All right, defaults to AC in this case. Change it to DC, all right, and that's using the leads on the end of your plug-in like you do here, okay? And then we've got the same modes. You've got resistance modes. You've got diode mode, I think that is. No, sorry, that's diode mode. I don't want some continuity mode. And capacitance built into this as well. Very handy. Then we've got a 2 amp AC default DC. Now this one, because it's reading a level when we're not actually got in circuit, we have to zero it. That zeroes it. Then we'll stick this on the lead and we'll see that this will give us the current as well. So this was how we could measure current without breaking into a wire. So if you've got a circuit you're trying to measure and you don't want to interrupt the power cabling, put one of these clamp meters around the wire. As I say, this is for DC, you have to make sure you're using an appropriate clamp meter for that. Another thing is, you can't put around two wires, you put both wires through this, like you have if you have like a twisted pair or a paired cable or something like that. Then you get zero, because they cancel each other out. What it's doing is measuring the magnetic field being generated by the cables. So you take one wire back out, try and get it so you can see it. Take one wire back out again, and it comes back. And if I change the wires, it will change direction. I'm just saying positive 0.5, change the other wire, it's going to say negative 0.5, thereabouts. Okay? You see a little negative symbol there. Alright, turn the power supply off for a second. So that's how to measure current. Now, you have to be careful if you're doing currents that you don't leave the meter probes in. Most meters will not warn you if you change modes on your meter and you leave the probes in here. So, if I were to measure the power supply now, obviously I, in this case I'm across the power supply anyway, it makes no difference. I'm, you know, doing a demonstration, you would say this isn't how you normally connect up to a power supply. If you were in the current mode and you had a high voltage power supply, even like a mains power supply, you know, you, you're trying to measure across mains or something like that, or some high voltage circuit, or even high current circuit, that have to be high voltage, you had it in these positions and you wanted to measure voltage and your supply wasn't current limited like my one is right here, because I've intentionally set up that way, this will blow the fuse out your meter. Now, a fluke meter, it will blow the fuse. It will cost you a bit of money to replace the fuse. But it's, you know, it might cost you 20 bucks or something to replace the fuse. So it's not a mistake you want to keep making because it will get expensive. But it won't damage the meter. A cheaper meter, I don't know what this one's like, but some meters don't even have fuses in them you can replace. Some, I've seen meters with no fuses in them. I've also seen meters with fuses which you cannot replace because they're soldered in, and yeah, it takes a bit of experience and the right fuses to be able to repair it. And it's also possible you'll blow the input circuitry on the meter. Not so common, but it can happen. If you're ever going to do any kind of measurements, once you've finished measuring current, even if you just pull the lead out, just take the lead out, then, doesn't matter what you do, you won't blow anything up. Like, if you had this in current mode, and you measured this across the AC mains, it would probably be a big spark and a bit of a bang. It could be quite frightening, and you potentially could cause some damage. Right, so take it out. Some meters will actually warn you when you are plugged into the wrong port. So if I plug that into here, doesn't matter because it's measuring voltage, current, there is no risk here. Right? But if I were to try and measure voltage and put it in the current jack, either one of them, this one doesn't say anything. Some meters will actually warn you when you're plugged into the wrong jack. This one doesn't. This will just put a little thing on there saying change the leads. Right? Just a little prompt. Change the lead when you go in and out of this mode. Okay? That's what it's going to tell you. But always be careful of that. Take the lead out. When you finish measuring current, take the lead out. Even if you just take it out and put it straight back in the voltage one. That way, nothing can go wrong. Well, probably not anyway. So now I've hooked up to this cheap meter. I've had this meter for like 25 years and it's been kept in my car. It's still on the original battery. <laughs> it's just kept in one of my cars. It's just been in there. I've only used it a couple of times to be honest. Um, so let's go to volts. So it start, this one starts at millivolts, 200 millivolts, 2000 millivolts is in 2 volts. I don't want to call it 2000 millivolts, we'll just call it 2 volts scale. 20 volts, 200 volts, 500 volts. Now, something you can be careful of is not exceeding the input ratings of the meter. This one says it's 500 volts max, 200 milliamps max across this input here, 
and 10 amp max on this input. It's also using this for a low current range as well. So be careful about the input ratings because you do not want to exceed these or even get close to them to be honest. Sometimes these ratings are not true, <laughs> especially on some lower cost imported meters let's say. So it's on 20 volt range right now, so if I turn the power supply back on we'll see about half a volt, just like we did before. So I'll put the voltage up, yeah we got the five, say 5 volts, 5 volts on there. 4.93 so accuracy is not as good but this meter has been sitting in a hot car for 25 years it's okay and to be honest does it matter if it's 0.07 volts out not really not in most cases so this meter actually has capacitance on it as well it does actually have it so it's got 200 microfarad and 2000 microfarad capacitance ranges on it as well which is quite surprising these are current ranges 20 milliamps 200 milliamps and 10 amps diode test hfe which is transistor testing so this is a bit of a gimmick in most cases. It just tells you the HFE, which is the gain of the transistor, which is plugged into this socket here. Very few meters these days actually have this built in because it was a bit of a gimmick. You have to try and get the leads plugged in and you have to have the leads long enough to reach the connections inside and stuff like that. And you can see it's got EBC, BCE, CEB. So depending on which orientation you put the transistor in, you get a different pinout. So you have to put it in the correct pinout connections here and you can test what the gain is on that transistor. That doesn't tell you that much. Really, you want to get a proper transistor test if you actually want to do that. To be honest, I've only used it a couple of times and I've never really been satisfied with the results, so these are more of a gimmick than anything else. So let's move to here as well. I should probably show you some of the secondary functions of this thing. So if I go to, say, DC volts, you've got min-max settings on this particular meter, and it will track the readings. And you can actually find out what the minimum and maximums are. So if you're probing around a circuit and trying to look at what you're doing with the probes and you can't see the meter or you just can't look at the meter at the time you're making the measurement you can use this min max mode and it'll hold the readings on the screen for you sometimes you also use the hold mode as well it's got hold mode if you can push it sometimes like some meters like this one it's got an automatic hold which is a bit nicer it holds it on display for a few seconds until there's another reading stuff like that also got ranging turn this off again so auto range in this one as I said before, I've got manual range as well, so you can go through each range, and this one will tell you what the range actually is. 6, 60, 600, 1000. This meter can go up to 1000 volts in DC. A lot of meters will have secondary functions on buttons, and it's pays to familiarise yourself with what these buttons actually do and the functions and the features they offer you. Sometimes they're not that important, other times they come in really handy. Depends on what you're trying to use the meter for. Another thing to be aware of as well is that when you try and measure resistance, how you probe can give you different readings. Quite important. So like this meter here can go up to 60 mega ohms. If I hold these probes, I am 1.2 mega ohms right now. You see that? 1.3. If I squeeze them harder, I'm getting down to 900k. Right? If I wet my fingers, it'd probably be even lower. There you go, I'm getting to 500k there. If you hold the probes whilst you're trying to measure a resistor, like you've got a loose resistor, you're trying to see what value it is, don't hold the probes. Pin it down to a disc. So if you've got you know something like this, pin it down with the probes, and that will then tell you. As long as not the service isn't conductive, that would be much better than you holding the probes because you will affect the reading. So don't forget to click like and subscribe if you found that video interesting. If there's anything you think I've missed which is important to cover in the future, let me know down below in the comments, and maybe I'll do another video about it and just go in a bit more detail about certain functions. Don't forget to check out the playlist here for the. Electronics for Beginners video series. There's a playlist over here YouTube thinks you should watch. Over there is a subscribe link for subscribing to my channel, so make sure you do that so you don't miss any of my future videos. Not only these teaching videos, but also my runs where I'm doing lots of these complicated repairs, which you might find interesting. And over here is my Patreon support link, so if you want to contribute to the channel to help me to make more video content and help me to help other people, there's a link there. Also, you can do super thanks down below if you want to give me a one-off donation, if you want to donate a little bit of money to the channel without being a big commitment, you can also do that too. Get you later.